Welcome, Dad, to the fifth episode in the Father and Son Pastoral Podcast. Our current series is the Jesus Said That series, looking at every word Jesus spoke in the New Testament. This episode is titled, Jesus Calls Philip and Nathaniel, mm -hmm. and this is taken from John 1, 43 through 51. Glad to be back with you and uh, loving working through uh, each of Jesus' statements. Thank you. So today's main question is going to be, how is Jesus like Jacob's ladder? Um, this is a question I put together because it makes you kind of scratch your head and say, how is Jesus like Jacob's ladder? Mm -hmm. uh, for those who are listening for the first time, I'm Pastor Kenny Burge Jr. And I'm joined by my father, Pastor mm -hmm. Dr. Ken Burge Sr. And, and just for our audience, where did you get your doctorate at, just so? Uh, I went to Dallas Theological Seminary uh -huh. and it was such a privilege. They opened up an extension uh, site in Philadelphia, uh, which permitted me to do the work there. So I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be a Dallas graduate. We're located right outside of Washington, D.C., yes. so Philly's a lot closer. Uh, we're in Maryland, exactly. so it's pretty close. But uh, let's, like I always say, let's just jump right into the text. Sure. Let's get to this. So we turn to uh, John 1 and verse for, uh, 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. So obviously the question is, when was the next day? Hmm. And I always think it's very important in our chronological order of the Bible just to know what has happened before mm -hmm. and then kind of clarifies what happens next. Yes. So if you remember from our timeline from last uh, podcast, you know that the context of this narrative is talking about when Jesus was baptized. So Jesus was baptized by John the baptizer. He then goes into the wilderness for 40 days. During this time, John is preaching and teaching. Um, at this time, we believe that is when the religious leaders come and ask John, are you the Messiah? Mm -hmm. He tells them no. Mm -hmm. Then Jesus overcomes all his temptation and he keeps walking back and forth by John yeah. in the wilderness there. Not really sure what Jesus is doing at that point, but mm -hmm. he keeps walking by. So John keeps pointing out saying, hey, here's the Lamb of God who takes away mm -hmm. the sin of the world. That's right. He points him out to the crowd. And then John points to Jesus and Andrew and John spend the day with Jesus. Yeah. And then after that point, um, Jesus meets Simon, names him Peter, and mm -hmm. says, you will be called Peter. So he has his first three disciples at that point, possibly, you know, uh, James too. Mm -hmm. So here he is with a couple disciples, and he's going to be traveling to the wedding. But before he gets to the wedding, he's going to meet two more men, uh, Philip and Nathaniel. Yeah, just want to uh, just comment. It's just uh, interesting how John is giving us a timeline, mm -hmm. more or less, by the term the next day. Uh, interestingly, it's an adverb of time, so it's very intentional uh, what he's doing. You had the same thing uh, back in verse uh, 29, uh, just before, behold, the Lamb of God, it says yeah. the next day. Yeah. And then the same thing in verse 35. So now we're on day four. And so it just kind of sets the stage for what John is building uh, toward and Galilee. And just, just a quick comment, because a lot of times you hear these towns or yes. regions and you go, where in the world is that? <laughs> uh, Galilee is the northernmost uh, region uh, in Israel, approximately 50 miles long, 25 miles wide. But it's a beautiful landscape, sort of speak. Because you've you got, been there. Yeah, been there. You, you, when you get into Galilee, you got Mount Hermon on the north. Mm -hmm. uh, down in the south is Mount Carmel. And then uh, over to the um, west is the Mediterranean. Wow. And then to the east is the Jordan River. Uh, so this Beautiful. is the location that they're traveling to. This is when it's annoying that it's a podcast because when I teach this, I always have pictures, videos, yeah, yeah. just to get the real sense That's of right. the beauty of this land. Hmm. So here he comes. And I always explain to people because uh, especially the youth, it gets confusing. They hear Nazareth mm -hmm. and they hear Galilee. Yeah. So I always kind of explain it that Galilee is the region, mm -hmm. you know, kind Very of good. how we live in a county or you could even say a state. That's right. And that's um, Galilee. And the Nazareth is the tiny little Mm -hmm. basically hick city that's right. yeah. <laughs> that he lives in yeah. uh, and what we're going to talk about that a little bit more so that's why he's from nazareth of galilee because a mm -hmm. lot of people are like where in the world is nazareth exactly. so they say in galilee which mm -hmm. is obviously in israel mm -hmm. so it says verse 43 the next day jesus decided to leave for 
Galilee. This will be the start of his ministry. That's right. He has a couple disciples, no apostles yet, just disciples. Mm-hmm. And Jesus had just left the Judean desert where he was tempted. Mm-hmm. He passed by the baptizer. Yeah. And he's traveling to Canaan. Mm-hmm. And it says, he found Philip and told him, follow me. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be assumed that since Philip is in this odd location, he could mm-hmm. be a follower of John the Baptist. We don't know. Mm-hmm. We we know so little about the apostles. and We like to create these things, their characteristics and all, but mm-hmm. we, we know so little. Did he know Jesus before? Did he not? Who? We have no idea. It just says he saw him and he called him. Yeah. And that's it. He just said, follow me. Um, I always point out that Philip, the disciple is not the same as Philip, the deacon, exactly. um, who converted the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter eight. Those are two different men. Um, because sometimes we tend to think those are the same guy, but, uh, very different Phillips. And with the calling, follow me, um, priceless words as found throughout the new Testament, really come be my apprentice, Mm -hmm. uh, come sit at my feet. Uh, it's it's a great expression. And think about what's going to happen to the disciples that follow him. Uh, in John chapter 8, later on, we'll see the words of Jesus with one of his I am statements. He says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And how true is this for these men? They're going to follow the light of the world and they are truly going to be enlightened uh-huh. in ways they never dreamed. And it's the same with us today. We're called to be disciples, oh. not apostles. That's exactly right. I was checking our YouTube channel and there was some super deacon apostle man. Because <laughs> 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 like, obviously the qualifications where you had to see Jesus, resurrection ministry and so forth. So uh, no apostles today, but we are called to be disciples. Yeah. So we can learn a lot from this. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida. Some say Bethesda. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the area around us, the nice yeah. area. Yeah. Uh, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Uh, Andrew and Peter had a house in Capernaum, mm-hmm. but John tells us that Bethsaida is where they were from. Yeah, the uh, the name itself means house of hunting or fishing. Mm. Uh, when I was in Israel in 93, your mom and I stayed right next to the Sea of Galilee in Tiberias, which is kind of the central part of the Sea of Galilee, uh, but to the west. Uh, the designated town here, Bethsaida, is to the northeast mm. of the Sea of Galilee, next to Capernaum and some other places. And it's uh, just real interestingly, too, Jesus did a lot of ministry in this region. Yeah. He only ministered for so many months when you put together the yeah. three and a half years. And I read estimates, he spent like 18 to 20 months in Capernaum alone. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think it's <laughs> just side note that mm-hmm. it shows that... Uh, Andrew and Peter probably had a little money too. Yeah. Because it seems like we know they had a house in Capernaum. Mm -hmm. That was Jesus's base of operation, but it's very possible they had one at their hometown too. That's right. So there's there's a chance, we don't know, Mm -hmm. um, but there's a chance they were successful in their fishing Mm -hmm. business. So verse 45, Philip found Nathanael and told him. So Jesus calls Philip and now Philip is so excited that he's going to go tell his friend Nathanael. We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law. And so did the prophets, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. And I have always admired Philip and Nathaniel. They just, I mean, I know all the mm-hmm. disciples besides Judas <laughs> right. seem like quality guys. Yeah. Um, but I just loved their friendship and we'll mm-hmm. talk about their friendship, even in death, um, how close they were as friends a little later. But the first thing Philip does after he's called by Jesus is go and find his friend. Mm-hmm. It shows that there was a relationship that was very religious. Um, they were looking for the Messiah, and he's like, hey, I have found the Messiah. And I also have uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke refer to Nathaniel as Bartholomew. Yes. So that, that's just kind of helpful when you're reading through mm-hmm. um, the Gospels. Mm-hmm. Now, one of my favorite statements, <laughs> and let's face it, a lot of people say this about where our church is located. Mm -hmm. Um, We're in PG County, so a lot of people mock us wrongly, but we do. We get mocked all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, People mock maybe where you're, uh, you know, the people listening, the hometowns they are from. Mm -hmm. Where is that? Oh, that's Mm -hmm. this little tiny town. And uh, can any good come out of Nazareth? Yeah. Nathaniel asked him. 
But I love Philip's answer. Come and see. Mm. See for yourself. Yeah. Um, church history teaches us that Philip and Nathaniel were best friends. Mm. And it seemed like they had a good friendship even before becoming uh, disciples and eventually apostles. Uh, history teaches us that Philip was killed for his preaching. Mm. He was the second apostle killed. Uh, we learned that he was killed about eight years after James, the brother of John, was killed. This means he had a very short ministry, but in that ministry led many to Christ. Mm -hmm. Um, but when I, I was researching some of his life, we found that after he was killed, Nathaniel risked his own safety, found the body of his dead friend, and mm. gave him a proper burial. So here are these guys, they're friends in life, one's killed, the other risked his life, goes, gets the body, and buries him. Then um, Nathaniel, <laughs> I know we're looking to the future here, uh, but from you know our lesson today, but Nathaniel was killed for preaching about Jesus also. And this was brutal, what church history, mm. they they can't really agree mm -hmm. on what really happened, yeah. but there was three traditions. Either they beat his body till he died, mm -hmm. uh, flayed his skin, yeah. which is, that's mm. just miserable. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make you want to go to McDonald's, that's right? Yeah. <laughs> and flay a fish. That's right. And then uh, beheaded him. Yeah. Um, so, and some people say, well, they did all three of these things to him. Yeah. They beat him, flayed him, and then yeah. cut his head off. So uh, these guys would suffer greatly for following Christ. And um, I know you have said on many occasions that that's how we know these people truly saw the resurrected Christ, because you wouldn't go through all of this right. if the resurrection was false. That's right. You you wouldn't be willing to have your uh, head cut off, your skin cut off, all that. Yeah, for a lie. Yeah. We have some eureka moments here, yeah. and I love the, the order uh, Jesus finds Philip, and the word find or found is Eureka uh, from the <laughs> Greek. So it's a Eureka moment. But then uh, you, you got to love this because Philip runs after his friend. Oh. It, it's what we're supposed to do too. And let's be honest, we have so many contacts, uh, unsafe friends. Once we get saved, you're a little different than I. In a sense, you grew up in a Christian home. I didn't. I had so many unsaved friends and it was just a great thing uh, to be able to connect with them because I had all these contacts uh, immediately. But just getting back to the, the sacrifice that we are called to make and following Christ, he's, yeah, he's gonna give us light, but in Mark 8, 34, Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, and he, and he gives three commands. Uh, he says, number one, and by the way, the first two commands are past tense commands. So in, in other words, do this permanently. Number one, deny yourself. Mm -hmm. And you better deny yourself because it's no longer about you or me. Uh, Paul would say in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. Uh, number two, take up your cross. Uh, what does that mean for you and me? It obviously means something different than literally for the Lord Jesus Christ, but we need to identify with the one who died for us. Mm -hmm. It's very clear that this is what happened uh, to the followers of Jesus Christ. And uh, still happens around the world. It still happens, yeah. exactly right. But then the third command is a present imperative, follow me. Mm. So you deny yourself, you take up the cross, and then you keep on following me. And yes, that could mean even to death. Mm. Uh, just real quickly, uh, in Revelation 7, you have the 144,000 that are supernaturally saved. Uh, they're characterized later on in Revelation 14 as mm. standing uh, with the Lord Jesus. I think they're martyred for their faith. But the one interesting statement that um, connects this is in Revelation 14, 4, it said that they follow the lamb wherever he goes and even to death. And truly Jesus' disciples here did that. And I think that's why we say come and see. Yeah. It gives kind of that kind of almost mystery, yeah. kind of with your friends. Sometimes we want to give them all the answers, but Say, come and see. That's right. Come to church with me. Come spend time with some of with me and my friends. That's right. And just come and see. That's right. And we're going to jump back to verse 45 just for a moment because mm -hmm. Philip said, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and the prophets. Yeah. Now we have to, being in the time we live right now, we tend to think Old Testament, New Testament. Clearly, New Testament wasn't written at that That's time. Right. We know that. But Jesus would uh, say in John 5, 39, you pour over the scripture mm -hmm. because you think you have eternal life in them, and yet they testify about me. And then he goes on to say in verse 46, 
For if you believed Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. If I can just give mm. a quick comment mm. here. Um, when Jesus says this, is to a group of people, it's they're called the Jews throughout John, most likely the religious mm. hierarchy, and they're not receptive uh, to Jesus. He basically <laughs> says, you guys have already gone over to scripture and you missed it. Because then, and, and I love the verse you pick here in verse 46, for if you believed Moses, it's a second class condition, assuming the statement not to be true. You haven't believed Moses. So if they don't really believe the words of Moses, Jesus goes, that's why you don't yeah. believe in me too. Definitely. Yeah. So uh, it's clear that the Old Testament speaks of Jesus now. Yes. I'll ask you something. I know what you're going to say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, do you believe that every Old Testament passage is about Jesus? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big movement today. It is. And it, it gets so creative. I had a couple professors at Bible college who believe that philosophy. And they could take the dumbest passage from Judges and say, well, this is a symbol for Jesus and the cross. And the, every Old Testament passage does not talk about Jesus um, but many of them do point to them through prophecy and symbols and such. But I, I think we should just make it clear here. We do not believe that every passage speaks about Jesus in the Old Testament. And when a plain sense makes perfect sense, seek no other mm -hmm. sense. I couldn't agree with you more. The Old Testament oftentimes is just glorifying God yeah. or it's pointing out rebellion. Whatever the case might be, um, you just have to track it in its context. And then obviously you look for New Testament correspondence if you have it. Uh, but a lot of times it's just speaking about uh, the Father. It's just speaking about uh, the nature of God or whatever. But yes, I, I we're both in the same category. We don't have to do exegetical uh, gymnastics <laughs> and cartwheels to get every passage pointing to Jesus. There are some clear ones that do, and we'll stick with those. And wouldn't you say as pastors, we see that a lot, that a lot of people have axes to grind. Yeah. That you have, uh, for instance, your tongue speakers who everything has to come back to tongues. Yeah. I mean, it could be a passage about David and Goliath. Right. And somehow it's coming back exactly. to tongues. Exactly. Um, I see that with certain people with, you know, everything is pointing to Jesus and the plan of salvation, you know, everywhere. And um, I always kind of mark when I'm listening to those people, mark that down. It's like, okay, they got agenda. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're pushing their philosophy on scripture. You nailed not it. letting scripture speak for itself. You, you know nailed it? it. They have their philosophy and uh, I think they foist it on the scripture because they force it upon the scripture uh, instead of just uh, doing truly what I call exegesis, letting the scripture speak for uh, themselves. They have a, a worldview of philosophy mm. and they put that upon the scripture and it just does great injustice to yeah. the word of God. And the way I explain it to young people is it's like the rose colored glasses thing. You get your glasses, yeah. Yeah. you know, Good point. just say, uh, this has to be that Jesus is in every passage you put right. on your glasses and then yeah. it's just magically there. Yeah. So um, I know that's a side point, but I just thought it'd be good to talk about because people get confused with that. Yeah. And you know, as you're pointing out here uh, from verse 45, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law. I mean, you have passages like Deuteronomy yeah, exactly. 18, and you have uh, two um, references, one in 15 and one in 18, where Moses says, there's going to be a deliverer like mm -hmm. me. Yeah. Uh, how, how clear is that? Clearly pointing to Jesus Christ. And they're the texts that are, stand out that is speaking of our Lord. Yeah. <laughs> when you have enough good text, why make them up? Exactly. So we see Nathaniel is not impressed and says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Now, yeah. A lot of research has been done on Nazareth. Mm -hmm. The nickname was the city of garbage. <laughs> How would you like to live in the city <laughs> of garbage? I've read uh, multiple authors on this and uh, it was believed to be located between Damascus and Egypt, yeah. and many people would travel through this town. Mm -hmm. So the residents who lived there, very few of them, did not like the travelers, so they would pour all their garbage in the main streets mm -hmm. so that their streets would stink. Yeah. Um, they hoped that the crowds would then pass by their town because of the trash on the streets. So. Uh, Therefore, it was the city of garbage. Mm. Um, I did a lot of research into this for my kids' curriculum. And yeah. Really small town. Yeah, They said it could be in a handful of people, maybe right. even under 100 yeah. um, people possibly. Mm -hmm. uh, for the longest time, <clears throat> pardon me, for the longest time, they didn't even know where Nazareth was. That's right. And they just discovered it on this like, little hill. <laughs> That's right, yeah. But it was the city 
of trash. So, and again, Jesus never meets our expectations. Mm -hmm. Here Mm -hmm. he is. He's God. And he grows up in the city of trash. That's right. Um, So how does Philip respond to his friend? Come and see. I love that. Then Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said about him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Now, being Gentiles, uh, you understand Greek and Hebrew, but I think in the English language, we miss a lot of the play on words that go on here. Mm -hmm. Uh, Other Israelites were obviously named after Jacob. Jacob was the man who uh, seemingly tricked everyone Mm -hmm. or was tricked. Mm -hmm. Uh, He tricked his father, Isaac. He tricked Esau. And uh, uh, it's important to remember what Esau said after Jacob stole his blessing, which is from Genesis 27, 36. He said, isn't he rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me twice now. He took my birthright and look. Now he has taken my blessing. Then he asked, haven't you saved a blessing for me? As a side note, that's why I told Becca, we're never going to name any of our children Jacob. If you're named Jacob, good for you. God bless you. you uh, Use it to honor God. But I don't think I want my my child to be named Deceiver. (laughs) And that's why he was renamed Israel. (laughs) You know, one who contends with God, wrestles with God. However, after Jacob sought God's blessing, he was renamed by God himself to Israel. I think Jesus is really saying that unlike Jacob, Nathaniel is not a deceitful man. That's right. And Nathaniel asked Jesus how he knows him. And then Jesus reveals his power by saying, before Philip called you, you were under the fig tree. I saw you. Mm -hmm. Why, Dad, why do you think Nathaniel was so amazed by this that just Jesus knew he was under a fig tree? Because to us reading today, it's like, wow, he was under a fig tree. So what? Yeah. Most likely, uh, Nathaniel is meditating on a life of Jacob, and uh, I think that's what he has in his mind, and he's amazed that here comes Jesus, and he not only knew he was under the fig tree, but actually what was in his mind. And as he was pondering uh, about Jacob and Jacob's life, Hmm. Jesus just exposes his thought. So what else uh, can Nathaniel do? Uh, But he says, ha we ask to theu. In other words, uh, uh, you are the son of God. Uh, and, And if I can be a little technical for just a second, it's the construct form from the Hebrew. You are the son who belongs to the category or the classification of God. It doesn't get any clearer no. than that from uh, the scripture who Nathaniel is saying that he is uh, at this point. And if I can just uh, kind of tie a couple things uh, yeah, together here with the word deceit that you uh, point out earlier, you know, they are in the a house of fishing, uh, Bethsaida. Uh, interestingly, the word deceit means to bait a hook. <laughs> that same term we find, uh, you had cited uh, Genesis 27, 36, the verse before 35. Uh, this is Isaac speaking to Esau, but he said, your brother came with deceit. Hmm. The same term from the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Uh, so all these thoughts are being uh, woven together, but... Jesus knows our every thought, and it just brings Nathaniel to a screeching halt that he just has to give this exclamation that Jesus is the Son of God. And he clearly knows Jesus's identity here. It's interesting, the man who's in Scripture, and he's not going around judging everyone, understands, because he says in verse 49, Rabbi, he says, so he's teacher, Mm -hmm. you are the Son of God. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. a pretty big statement. Yeah. You know, I've never met anyone's like, you're the son of God. Yeah. And you are the king of Israel. So he understood he's the teacher, he's divinity, yeah, and he's the king. Yeah. So and Nathaniel is just so obviously, as you said, when this happened, there was a lot going on. What he was thinking. Yeah. Um, it's not like, oh, he saw me in a fig tree. Okay, you're God. Yeah. You're you yeah. know, obviously there there's a lot mm-hmm. going on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And probably Jesus I kind of almost picture him saying this with a little grin. So Jesus responded to him, do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree, you will see greater things than this. And that is such an accurate statement. We see that Nathaniel later would be given the power to heal the sick and cast out demons. Right. 
He would preach the gospel and see lives changed. He would watch Jesus do many miracles and learn about the kingdom of God. He would later hear of Jesus's death. Sadly, only John among the disciples, the Mm -hmm. apostles were there at his death, but he would hear about Jesus's death, but then he would see him resurrected. And I kind of picture older Nathaniel, older Philip, you know, years removed from this. Obviously, they didn't live to be super old, but mm-hmm. probably laughing, looking back and thinking how small this sign was yeah. compared to everything else Jesus said and did. Yeah. But obviously, John, to him, this was a special moment and this Holy Spirit inspired him to write this down. And then just trying to demonstrate faith. Yeah. Do you believe? Yeah. I mean, just shy of 100 times does the word believe occur in John's gospel, only 248 times total new testament references almost 100 here in john because these are in that you may believe that jesus is the christ the son of god so what jesus is doing is to inspire faith uh in his disciples then verse 51 i I didn't understand for a very long time in my life yeah when i did bible reading i just kind of said oh that's great and kept going (laughs) but (laughs) not how you should study but i got it once when i was teaching it Mm -hmm. verse 51 then he jesus said truly i tell you you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending Mm -hmm. on the Son of Man. Now, once again, this is obviously a reference to Jacob's dream. Mm -hmm. And the question is, well, what happened in Jacob's dream? Mm -hmm. And we find that in Genesis 28, 12. And he dreamed a stairway was set on the ground with its top reaching the sky Mm -hmm. and the angels were going up and down on it. So what did Jesus say? Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open Mm. and the angel of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So the question, and this is where I really want our audience to engage, Mm -hmm. what is the Mm -hmm. main difference between these two verses? And it's amazing that Jesus is the staircase. That's right. He replaces Jacob's ladder. That's right. In Jacob's dream... The angels came down from heaven via a staircase to earth. Mm -hmm. In other words, God was sending his word via angels down the staircase to mankind. However, in Jesus's version, he is the stairway between God and man. Jesus is the link between God and man. And if people would just understand that, he is the only way to the Mm -hmm. Father. Mm -hmm. So... When I read that, when I understand that, it's such an amazing picture. Mm -hmm. Here's God up here. We can't get to him here. We are way down here on earth. And Jesus is the ladder between God and man. Michael Card, and I'm sure you want to comment in a second, but Michael Card writes, John's remarkable story, or John's remarkable story leaves us scratching our heads, Mm -hmm. wondering what in the world just happened. This would be a good place for John to whisper some explanation in her ear but he remains freshly silent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, there's so many things I think I look forward to yeah. going to be with the Lord one day and talking to these guys and say, so what happened next? <laughs> That's you know, right. We know what happened the next couple of days, but right. what, what happened immediately after that? Before we jump into our appointment, is there anything you want to add? Or No, that was just okay. uh, so well said. And um, we have to give thanks for God dispatching Jesus. Yeah. That's all there is to it. He loved the world. Uh, so he gave us his best in the sun, oh. and we should just be ever thankful oh. for just that alone. We have it described by Paul as what? The indescribable gift, oh. and that's who our Lord Jesus is. So let's jump to our employment, mm-hmm. what we can take from uh, the passage itself and then do with it, because we don't want to be like the Pharisees. That's right. <laughs> they knew the passages, obviously Old Testament, mm-hmm. but they knew them, but they didn't know how to apply them. Yeah. So we see from the passage, Philip pointed Nathaniel to Jesus. Philip wanted his friend, possibly his best friend, they seem very close, to know about Jesus, that he was the Messiah, which scripture had pointed to. Mm -hmm. Do you have the same zeal for your friends as Philip did for Nathaniel? Um, I, 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 I wish more Christians just had that, "Mm, I need to tell my friends, I need to bring them to church. There are many who do. So don't take that as a negative statement, but I always wish there was more who just kind of had that viewpoint, like, I know the Messiah, I want you to know him too. Let me share a a funny brief story with you, taking you back to the 1970s. I just gotten saved, have all these unsaved friends. 
uh, I couldn't shut up about Jesus. Mm -hmm. So I got a group of them to come to church. We were having an evangelist coming in and we packed two pews. Uh, Back in those days, we had pews. You are blessed with comfortable chairs. I remember those. (laughs) Orange and brown. It was really hard to sleep in a pew, let me tell you. Just real quick, wasn't that back when the sanctuary was lime green? Yeah, it was a beautiful... And the pews were orange. (laughs) Yes, yes. Thank God we've made some changes since then. And, uh, but so an evangelist is coming to town. I invite so many of my friends. We pack out two pews and what does the evangelist preach on? He preaches on hair length. He <laughs> preached on hair length. And uh, so I want to make a distinction here, uh, you know, and um, bring them to Jesus, but make sure they hear about who Jesus Gospel. Christ is, uh, because that's so very important. I actually had my one friend who, out of the lot that had come that day, who came back many years later, and he had been in the military, and he looked at me, and he still remembered the incident, <laughs> and he said, hey, 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 look, Kenny, he said, uh, my hair's short. <laughs> he didn't feel bad at all. So make sure you're truly bringing them to Jesus. Wow. And it is, we do. It's a natural thing to bring them to church, and, and we preach Christ crucified. We're not ashamed about that. Yeah. But just, just make sure whatever your venue is, that you bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ, that they can get the gospel. And that's why it's important for church to have different venues. Um, at our church, when you preach each Sunday, mm-hmm. um, you go through a book. So it's what's ever going on in that book. That's right. But it's a wonderful thing. Um, it's not gospel every week. Yeah. You will throw in gospel. I, I notice when we have visitors and stuff, you tend to throw in a little gospel at the end. <laughs> yeah. But um, that's right. I, I've had friends, and I want to be very careful that I don't offend here, but who go to churches that all they do is preach the gospel every week. Yeah. And those friends tend to know very little because all they know is the gospel message. So obviously you need to have your friends come to venues where they can hear the gospel. But to, at the same time as a pastor, we need to feed our flock. Yeah. So that's why uh, how I have it organized with um, Monday night, mm-hmm. we have our gospel and games, yeah. which is totally outreach. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a Tuesday in Bible study. We're going to be starting that back up after COVID messed up everything. Mm-hmm. But uh, we'll be starting that up soon where that is truly just for the Christian child to come mm-hmm. and they really learn the scripture well. Mm-hmm. But um, I think it's important to know where to bring your unsaved friends. That's right. Uh, in wisdom, um, where you go. And But, you know, I know if they come to church on Sunday, they're going to hear the gospel presented, especially when you see that friend there or, and they're going to hear the word preached which is so important. And I also think it's important for Christian friends to hang out. Uh, We tend to think of church only as service, where it's really the individuals who make up the body of Christ to say, hey, come with my Christian friends. That's Mm -hmm. why Bible studies are good. Um, I even have our youth uh, Bible study at uh, my house Mm -hmm. because we can can sit around this very table, play games, talk, pull out our Bibles, have a presentation on the TV over there. They can get coffee, snacks, and yeah. it's just a, a friend. It's an environment where it's just much more intimate than come sit in a pew right here. You know, so I mean, obviously, it depends on the person's situation, but uh, it, you got to bring your friends to Jesus. You got to go get them. Uh, you know, I just mm-hmm. I just tell people when you look at the scripture, Jesus is motivating disciples to go into all the nations. So you got to go find the lost and then you have to train the found. Well, I was 18, Um, I had been saved two years. I was always working with younger men and I didn't have a home at that time. Uh, So traditionally, what would I do during the week? And this was a regular occurrence. We went to uh, the gym, Uh, we'd lift some weights and then we'd go what was the uh, local hangout, the steak and egg kitchen. But we we fellowshiped and we talked about Jesus and we had discipleship. And we just hung out together. And that was so vital. You do that masterfully here. You open up your home. You've got the best uh, coffee supply. Uh, For those of you who don't know, uh, when I had my three sons at home, my wife and I always enjoyed our dinner time. Um, She would fix the meal. My tradition was I'd fix us coffees after the dinner. And uh, so we'd sit and chat and we'd have some fellowship. And you do that now so wonderfully um, with so many of the young people in our church. And I, and I just love seeing it. So you, we're, we strive for that kind of no. balance. Yeah. So, And if you go to my father's house, I did buy him a shaker 
but it's for his iced coffee to cool it down very quickly. <laughs> so <laughs> if you see this shaker, don't think we're having martinis Thank you. or booze. Thank uh, you. That's right. You both choose not to drink. Appreciate uh, obviously, it. if you want, that's an issue for another day. But <laughs> as pastors that work with people who drink, uh, yeah. we, we choose not to. But if yeah. you see the shaker there, it's just for <laughs> yeah, the uh, cold coffee. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but uh, that's going to be a topic we could talk about another time with uh, Liberty. But uh, so questions I need to ask myself. Do I tell my best friends about Jesus? Do I um, ever tell them to come and see? So I encourage my church family at Coleman Manor Bible Church, find one friend and invite them. Let the Holy Spirit work them over. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You show them love, kindness, say what you need to say, invite them and uh, tell them, come and see. Right. You know, just come and see. Come sit with me, and we'll go to lunch afterwards. Mm-hmm. Most people won't want to come for the service, but they'll come for lunch. They will. And then uh, God will do what he does with them. Mm. So do I talk to my friends about Jesus and the scripture, mm. or do I only do that in the church building? Yeah. What does my answer tell me about my faith? I really pray that the church family is very organic in the sense that it's wherever you're at. You talk about the things of Christ. And then we have our second and final employment point, and we just look at the text first. Jesus was amazed by, uh, Nathaniel was amazed mm-hmm. by Jesus's words. Mm-hmm. Nathaniel was blown away by Jesus's words and said, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Mm-hmm. So I think we have to look at our, our own selves and say, are we amazed as we read the words of Jesus? And how does his words change our lives? Mm-hmm. And then a question we should ask ourselves, am I amazed and challenged by Jesus's words? Obviously, we haven't seen too much with Jesus's teachings at this point. But once we get to the Sermon on the Mount, yeah. parables, uh, uh, it, it hits you hard. So, um, And then thoughts. Do I marvel at Jesus's words or do I find them uninteresting? Mm. Do I read about Jesus because I want to or because I have to? And then I added in, uh, this week I will monitor my speech. And this is a challenge for all those listening. At, tell yourself, this week I will monitor my speech as I talk with friends and see how many of my conversations point them to Jesus. Uh, so many of our conversations, and this is football season, are about football. Yeah. Um, we have elections today. Yeah. So much is about elections. And those things are great to talk about. Sure. I'm not saying you're one of those people that every conversation has to be just about Jesus. But um, we need to monitor our speech and say, how can I take these conversations and turn them into gospel presentations or in- invites to church, um, mm-hmm. talk about things that really matter? Because yeah. I bet if I asked you uh, what two years ago on Tuesday the weather is, you probably don't know. Right. And uh, so when we talk about things like that, the value goes way down. Being amazed by Jesus's words, you now know the experience I've had it for decades. We prepare a lot of lessons, we prepare a lot of mm. sermons, but the way I think of us oftentimes is almost like that temperature gauge on a turkey or a chicken. You know, it's 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 meshed right down into the chicken, right into the turkey, but at a certain temperature, then that thing opens up. Mm. I always feel like that should be us. You know, we're sitting, we're studying the word, and then we are amazed by Jesus' words. And then at that point, it's almost like it pops open and, and we gotta go share it with someone. Yeah. That's what's supposed to happen to all of us personally, you know, as we're encountering the Lord daily uh, and we are amazed by his words, then we got to go share it with others. There's just an enthusiasm that should come uh, from our lives. And isn't that how it is? We have good food. We yeah. want to tell people about it. That's right. We have a good experience. We want people to experience it with us. Yeah. And speaking of chicken, Becca has invited you and mom over for fried chicken tonight for dinner. So I, I told mom and she was very excited. <laughs> Would you like me to bring my shaker? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just, we'd we'll love to come. Thank you. We're so, excited. Uh, yeah. Becca made me some fried chicken last night, but she uses the air fryer. Yeah. So it's way better for you. And mm, it was. My stomach's <laughs> growling on the end of the table. <laughs> it was good. To that, but, it, yesterday yeah. was a hectic day. And, uh, but it was some good fried chicken. So we're making some more tonight without, without the grease. So, <laughs> all right. So finish up here. Yeah. A main question, how is Jesus like Jacob's ladder? And he is the stairway between God and man. Mm. Jesus is the link between God and man. I said that twice because we just have to get that concept. That's right. That's right. That if I want to approach the father, I need to go through the son. By coming to Jesus, we can understand the heart and mind of God. 
And that's how I am approaching or have been approaching my Bible reading Mm -hmm. is when I'm reading the words of Jesus, the mind of God is being revealed, his will, his actions, what he desires. And then I need to take that and implement that into my life. Mm-hmm. Um, any closing thoughts before? Uh, uh, yeah, just the uh, the linkage here between God and man. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. Oh. And uh, he is the way. And there's no question uh, about that. Nathaniel comes to recognize this. We have come to recognize that as well. And it is our mission uh, to share that with others. And I'm just so thankful again for the Father sending the Son and that Jesus would just say ever so clearly, you know, I am the way, I am the truth, I'm the life. And then the, the other verse I just want to close on that I referenced before is John 8, 12, I'm the light of the world. Mm. Uh, he who follows me, because Jesus is speaking to followers here, shall not walk in darkness, mm. but have the light of life. And I, and I pray for all of us uh, that will take Jesus's words, will appreciate them, will stand in awe of them, and our hearts and lives will be sincerely changed, and then we'll share that with others. And that's why there's one mediator Amen. between God and man, that's Jesus right. Christ. That's why we don't do the whole burning candle things, praying to dead saints, Yeah, because uh, they ain't hearing it. <laughs> you know, there's, they're just celebrating up with uh, God in heaven. That's right. You know, at this point, and... Uh, we pray to Jesus in Jesus' name yeah. to the Father because He's the only one who goes between us. And if anyone says contradicts that, look at Scripture. Look at Scripture. So, uh, but yes, Jesus is that ladder. Mm. And that was the fifth episode in the Father and Son Pastoral Podcast in the Jesus Said That series. This episode was titled "Jesus Calls Philip and Nathaniel." Mm-hmm. Uh, God bless you, and we'll see you next time.